Don't tell me those things. <laughs> well, actually, actually, I've been I've been traveling. Um, you did so I just say. got into Calabar last night. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's been crazy. And uh, some of those places I've been to, there's no uh, proper Wi-Fi or internet, or even light for that matter. So, why are you traveling, by the way? Are you writing a travel book? <laughs> it's um, no, it's not a travel book. It's um, confidential. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Hello, yeah. everyone. Hello, welcome, everybody. So nice to see you. Very excited to see all your beautiful faces so far, the ones that I can see. Um, we're just going to give our um, other attendees some time to join us. We're going to give them a few minutes. Um, while we wait, I'm just going to play a little bit of music. My name is Munshia. I'm from the Goethe Institute, Johannesburg. And I'm very happy to be here with you guys. Um, I hope you don't mind. We're going to be recording the setting, the sitting today. Um, just if you have an issue with it, just let me know. Send me a quick message. You can just switch off your camera if you don't want to be seen or anything like that. Just let me know and there's no issues. Uh, so we're just mm. going to turn yeah. it to the music now for a little bit. Um, so the person who's going to be singing in this clip is... Uh, we uh, recorded the the um, the video at our Goethe Institute Library in Johannesburg. Her name is Zoe Madiga. We're very excited to have this. We have a, a series. It's called the Library Jam Sessions. So I'm just gonna play her beautiful, soothing music while we wait for everyone to come in. I hope that's okay. All right. So I'm about to share the screen now. Uh-huh. Uh, just give me a second.
Dan Bonat. Hello, welcome to those that join us. I think we have quite a few people here. I uh, will continue allowing more people in. I think more people are still coming. Um, I'd like us to um, just welcome to the sitting today. I'm very excited to see everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us and taking the time to uh, have these conversations with us. Uh, so I'd like to hand it over to Zuki now at the moment, if that's okay with you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Zango. I'm very honored to have in this session of Virtually Yours, my brother, my friend, and this is the first time that I'm going to mention this, a writer that I want to be like when I grow up. Abu Bakr, welcome. Thank you, Zakiswa, my amazing friend, my fellow conspirator, my fellow 49er and my fellow other things. Uh -huh. um, um, this, is, this, is, this is going to sound odd to people, but this is a mutual admiration society. So if I and Zooks continue admiring each other's writing and aspiring to be like each other when we grow up, please bear with us. 419 and Degwa. It's um, in 2014, Abu Bakr was declared one of Africa 39, people most likely to change the face and the narrative of African literature. Um, happened to be on that list as well. We call ourselves 419ers. Shall I reveal it or not, no. Abu Bakr? No, no, it's, it's, okay. it's a trade secret. <laughs> All right, it's a trade secret. Um, right, Abu Bakr, maybe you can start us off by reading something before we uh, start. Hafiz, would you be so kind as to mute yourself? Okay. Um, so I'm just going to read um, a section because Zooks chose it. Um, the story is titled A Very Brief Marriage. And uh, it's about a new couple that had a very stranger few nights um, into their wedding. The bastards knocked on my door three nights after my wedding. I stared, my hand at feet caressing the coral blue silk sheets, my toes clipping my husband's bony ankle. Yusuf, as I had discovered over the last two days, slept like a turned off machine, something that required significant efforts to reignite. Of course, I had ideas how to rouse him if I wanted. My tongue, I knew, was an effective key to start any engine. But in the early days of marriage, I talked and had been told that it was prudent to appear modest. I've been told that decadence in matrimony is something to be snuck in with time after being sufficiently soused in marital broth. The knocks came again with some bravado and urgency, and I was certain I hadn't imagined them. My first instinct was to look at the clock. I put my hand on Yusuf's shoulder and gave him a proper shake. He grumbled. There's someone at the door, I said. Who? I don't know. It's 2 a.m. Tell them to go away, he mumbled, turning over. Whoever was at the door was getting impatient, and I gave the door and gave the door a couple of good kicks. Yusuf staggered out of bed, out of the bedroom. I got up, pulling my nightgown about me, and followed him across the living room to the front door. It was a quaint flat we lived in, with just the bedroom, with just the one bedroom, a bathroom and suite, and a rather spacious kitchen. Having grown up in the crowded heart of Zango, not far from the cattle market and some way off Potpa Avenue, I had insisted Yusuf find us a flat in Angwan Matanza, Zango's new suburb, with smart new buildings and colonnaded streets where one often woke up to chirping birds, not honking cars and revving engines. But the peace I sought was threatened at that moment by the rats on the door. Baby, ask who is there first, I whispered as my husband reached for the door. Why, he barked angrily. 
visitors, the night answered. A rush of goosebumps. A jump in my heart propelled me towards my husband until I was inches from him. What visitors, he asked, now fully alert. Friendly ones with guns, knives, and a rather beautiful barandami, even if I say so myself, the bull voice returned. Open the door, please. What do you want? There was a pause. My friend, my friend. There's a cheeriness in the voice now. Why not open the door and find out? This is no way to treat visitors, is it? I don't know you, sir. I don't know what you want. We're only here to pay visits and we'll come in peacefully or otherwise. But of course, we prefer it to be peaceful. Better for everyone that way. Don't you agree, my friend? Yusuf turned to me, his face a collage of confusion and fear. He reached out and held my hand, then turned to the door. Go away. The man outside sighed. My friend, we haven't got all night to play this game. We'll give you 30 seconds to open this door. If you don't, we'll break it down. And I promise you, I won't like the thing. It was the longest 30 seconds of my life. Hello? In which... Hello? Go, go on, Abaka. Okay. Hello? It was the longest 30 seconds of my life in which I imagined the man on the other Hi. side smoking weed and looking at the fridge, counting down the seconds in which my heart went through the seasons, dying in the hammer time, reviving in the rainy season. Even his countdown was delivered with a touch of nonchalance, a dreadful, terrifying assurance. Quickly, our options, which were not many to start with, pinned out. Calling the police guaranteed nothing. They might turn up in the next hour or so, or by daybreak when they are sure the robbers must have left. When the intruder counted down to zero, he sighed. Break it down, he said. After a second's delay, there was a startling bang on the door. I staggered backwards and fell on my backside. Yusuf leapt over me, a gazelle in full flight, his foot brushing my forehead as he sprinted to the bedroom. Even in my terror, I was proud that he was going to get a weapon to scare them off. My man, my hero. But he slammed the bedroom door short and I heard the latch violently rattling into place just as another bang came from the door. The sound of metal tearing, shredding my feet, my reality. My cloud framed illusions ruptured. I scrambled to the bedroom door, threw my body against the study panel and bounced off like a stuffed door. Baby, open the door, I cried. Baby, my tongue too slow to catch up on this betrayal, but fear raised my fist and I thumped it on the door. Open the door. The, da the, do the latch remained in the catch. There was silence from both sides of both doors. Yusuf, open the door for me. I was angry now. What stupid game was this? My husband locking me out of the bedroom with bandits trying to knock down the front door. God damn it, open this door. The huge bang ripped more panels off the front door. I hammered on the bedroom door like a demented pin. Anger, shock, and disappointment welled inside me as if thrown into a blender. I heard the front door give way. I wept away the tears in my eyes and drew my gown about me. I looked around the living room for something to layer over my body. This purple see-through see gown I had worn for my husband would give this man ideas. But then, why did it matter? If my husband abandoned me to their ravages, why did any of it matter? A final bang. The door flew open, terror pushing me back against the bedroom door. They sounded in, three men, led by a giant who had to stoop to get under the door frame. Even though he had a mask hiding the lower half of his face, from his bulk, I suspected he was gory. Legends of the menace of Zangu were so vivid that even if I had never seen him before, his build and reputation made him unmistakable. The other men took positions behind him, clutching different weapons. And true, he had a barandami, the sharpened edge of the sight like blade, gleaming, ready to harvest my head. The giant's eyebrow crinkled up in, in question. Who are you? This is my house. Who are you? I said. 
the fire in my bones masked the fear tightening its grip around my throat. I expected the cough blade to swing my way, but I refused to close my eyes, refused to let my bladder go. So I clamped my ties together. He seemed surprised by the question, the gleam in his eyes suggesting he was smiling, amused by my misery. He looked around the living room at the golden curtains I had chosen to give the room a rich imperial ambience. And the puffy furniture, new rocks, the shiny TV stand. We are sons of the wind, he said. But if this is your house, why are you locked out of your bedroom, Camaria? What use would it be denying us a bride? The still fresh china pattern from my exposed hands and legs were evident. It's my house. I can be anywhere I want to, can't I? I said. I knew I wasn't making sense, even to myself. One of them sounded to me, stood so close to me and sniffed. Lale, he said. Lovely perfume. Don't look at me like that. I'm a married woman, I said, scowling. Ha ha, ho ho. They laughed like idiots watching a puppet theater. I was the puppet, the object of this amusement. You heard her. Don't look at her like that. We are not here for that, the giant said, then turned to me. What's your name? I said nothing. I am not a very good man, Amaria. I hurt people, but today I'm in a good mood. Or I was until that Zachary locked his wife out of the bedroom. So please answer my question. Nana Aisha, I said. Nana, we want money, jewelry, and the son of a dog who refused to open the door. I presume that is your husband. I said nothing. What kind of baboon locks his wife out of out for men like us? He must hit you a lot. Namuji, one of the bandits said. A real coward, another agreed. Not a coward, the giant said, setting his bulk on my fine sofa. A worthless son of a dog. One with a fine, unfortunate wife like this. Break down that door and bring him to me. Amaria, step aside. Let my men do their work. I'll stop there. Thank you very much for that, Abu Bakr. I, oh. um, I, I'm not even sure which is my favorite in this collection. I mean, you outdid yourself. Um, tell okay. me about, I'm gonna ask you, my first question is gonna be an old one that you've heard a lot, but that a lot okay. of people here who have not had the chance to hear you speak, but who I know are also part of the group that I call for, Friends of Reza, would like to know. <laughs> Your women characters, how do you do that? How do you write them so well and uh, research them and get their emotions and everything like proper? Because generally, most guys don't write women as well. Um, I don't know. I think my women characters write themselves more or less uh i'm just the interpreter of their of their stories of their ideas of their vision their emotions um their joys angers and uh, whatever else they feel i i just interpret so in that sense i think they just come fully formed they are who they are they are good they are evil they are in between sometimes they are they are bitches, they are angels, they are whatever they want to be. I just interpret for them. Basically, that's it. Um, I, I think it's, right. that's a lot Go of on. noise coming from somewhere. Yeah. I think it's basically about just uh, connecting with the characters and actually listening to them, you know. Um, and maybe sometimes you don't have the patience as a writer to do that because you are. Um, we're in a hurry to get this story over and done with so that you can move on to other things to, to live, to be who you're supposed to be, to not be possessed by this character, right? Um, so it takes patience to, to just listen to these characters, to actually connect with them and then interpret them accurately as they want to be interpreted. I think that's, that's, that's it. We already have a question for you. Uh, Prince, can you please mute yourself? Prince, can you mute yourself, please? You already have a question. 
Ndegwa wants to know, have you ever found yourself in an ambush like the one in the piece? <laughs> have you ever uh, been yourself? No, 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 no. Fortunately not. But I have been ambushed by um by by, by Razor fans who have wanted to beat me up for what happened to Razor, whatever that is. Um so yes, I've been ambushed by a lot of angry women, uh, old women, young women, uh, you know, who who are not entirely happy with me. Uh but yeah, not not in the sense of uh, that uh, very brief marriage kind of ambush now. Right. Here's a crazy thing that happened. While I was reading, um, while you were reading a very brief marriage right now, I was thinking mm -hmm. about it and I couldn't help but think, I felt like there were some parallels with the garbage man in the whispering trees. Is it just me? Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about the women characters in particular. Uh, in what in what way? No, I just like the way they um they assert themselves in a in a situation where uh the men don't expect them to. So, for instance, with 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 Yusuf's wife, you know, with um when when she with with Nana when she comes through, she gets into a space where she doesn't uh she just says no, she's not going back to this guy, you know uh when when the delegation comes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and 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 also then in the garbage mm -hmm. man this woman just realizes no okay this guy looks good on paper he's everything but decides mm -hmm. maybe no she doesn't want she doesn't want what you call it and i and i kept thinking about that like about how you you give voice to these characters you know mm -hmm. um yeah. and, and so i was wondering whether somewhere it was in your background or it just it just happened and it was only something that I saw. Mm. I think the issue is that, uh, you know, those women are assertive. In a way. Um, they, they had ideas about what their lives were going to be like. Like uh, Nana is showing she married Yusuf, right? She believed she had married the perfect man. They were going to be happy together. They were going to like live until he's 99 or something. <laughs> and then and then uh you know three days into the wedding this, this i see what happens. you did there <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i did that yeah but you know um you, there are circumstances that come up right that um I don't know where this noise is coming from. Uh, there's a lot of noise. Sorry. Go to answer to it. Someone has their mic on. Kindly mute Prince, please. Can you please mute? Can you please mute Prince? Yes. Because there's so much background coming from him. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So I was saying that uh, you know, three days into it, into the wedding, something comes up, and she realizes that this is not the person I thought I'd married. And uh, you know, with with the garbage man, in the same sense, there's that fact that you know, you know, the guy looks perfect on paper, but then the marriage happens, and then she realizes, well, he's not exactly what I want, right? And then she meets this guy who she thinks might be exactly what she wants, uh, but she never considered that possibility that she might ever want someone like that. And uh, so we have these women who are confronted with choices that they have to make, um, either to take it for England or... <laughs> 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 right. they could take it for... <laughs> or they could walk right mm. <laughs> and, all uh, right in the case of nana Isho, you know she just decided you know uh, it doesn't matter what happens this this is over it's done with you know and i'm not going back mm. i must i must admit uh in spite of his darkness and everything that that mm -hmm. particular story made me you know, all your, all your stories are kind of interlinked in, this is the book, guys, uh, Dreams and Assorted Nightmares. It's available in Nigeria, I know. I know it's going to be here in Prestige Books in Nairobi this coming week. Uh, it's already been ordered. It's only a matter of days. So here's the book. If you don't win it, please get a copy for yourself. Um, but your, your stories are interlinked. And I have to say, this particular story made me absolutely like, 
I kind of felt kindly towards um towards towards Corey. He was just like there's something very nice about him. Can despite all his darkness and madness and stuff, can you talk about the character of Corey? I mean, I, I think he's a fascinating character. I liked him a lot. Uh, really, really, really did like him. You know, and uh, he's someone who's trying to carve a name for himself to be the person he is. And he has this uh, college childhood trauma that he has been carrying all his life. But people don't see that. They just see this giant who is a bully, mm. who, you know, beats up people, takes their money, harass married couple <laughs> and that stuff like that but mm. uh, you know he is he's afraid of something right uh, people don't see the fear that he mm. has that fear of being alone of being abandoned of being taught weak um, you know and uh, that is how he decides to manifest his own uh, listen but I think you see more of him in his relationship with his wife and yeah. yeah yeah making monsters and and his son as well you know um and mm. that's that in those stories the man uh comes forward you know his main character comes through and you see exactly what he's afraid of and uh what motivates him i think he's a fascinating character i enjoyed i absolutely enjoyed writing him i enjoyed writing he, his he wife the middle is. judge and, and his son as well mm. yeah. He's, he absolutely is. I was thinking, actually, even when I was reading uh, Making Monsters, you know, mm. where I was thinking, I could actually, like, in my head, I, I could see the very diminutive but very cheeky Maimuna, mm. you know, like, mm. I, I, knew, I mm. knew her. And, and I was thinking about, like, the number of mothers that I've also heard doing the very same thing that Maimuna does to, to, to that, where, where mm. she says to him, yeah. you know, somebody hit you. Did you hit him back? And I was like, oh my God. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean, absolutely. We saw we saw a lot of that when we were kids, right? Like you, mm. you come home crying and they say, oh, what the hell is that? Go back and sort that shit out. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> right. Because you know, uh, um go on. Yeah, I think it's uh are now far more protected than than uh, we were growing up, you know. Um so mm. now you I mean, like you protect you, you fought for yourself growing up, and now you're fighting for your kids, right? You show yeah, them, absolutely. put them in fence property, and uh, they don't even walk to school. You like drive them or take them or get someone to take them or something, right? Back then, you mm. walk to school, you get into fights with people, you, you get bloody noses, and you give some people bloody noses as well, you know. And uh, th- those were some of the things I wanted to reflect on writing that story. Mm. Okay. Now, here in Zao, Zao is a fictional place, and yet there are a lot of things. There's the magical and the crazy and the beautiful, mm-hmm. but the very real things that happen. Can you take us through your creating that particular, um, particular those particular characters and creating the world of Zao? Um, well, I mean, the process is... Uh... It's been something I've been wanting to do for a while, you know, this idea of the scene or the setting as a place, as a character in the story. And uh, I don't know how many people have read uh, Miguel Street by uh, V.S. Nepal. Yes. You know, he had something, he did something similar. That was more of a novel than a collection of short stories. Uh, but then for me, I read them as short stories that were interconnected. And uh, ever since I read that a long time ago, you know, I've always, imagine doing something like that with characters whose story kind of intertwine with each other. Um, but creating Zongo was, was a special thing. It really was special. Um, but Zongo didn't come out of a vacuum. It's been there before. It's uh, in the whispering trees. And uh, I just decided to incarnate it with different characters in a different age. And um, and because of what, what Mazade was, which was Zango before it became Zango, right? Um, it was a magical space with magical characters and all of that. And I just took it up a notch in, in this collection. And uh, that was how we got to where we are, you know? So it's this mix of the ordinary, the mundane and the fantastical. And uh, I'm, I'm always conscious when I write the fantastical, not to overwrite the fantastical to the extent that, you know, the real kind of uh, gets buried in it because um, the issues we're talking about here, issues of uh, 
mental health, you know, um, relations, childcare, uh, childhood trauma, uh, failed marriages, things like that. They're all real issues that, that exist in our, in our world as we live in today, you know. Uh, so burying all of it in the fantastical will give the service to all these issues that are very pertinent. Uh, but then at the same time, as we exist in this our society, you know, the mundane and the fantastical coexist. Um, where somebody believes in the superstitions of his ancestors and all of that, even though he doesn't have a scientific proof, right? For me, those things are very, very important that they coexist somehow, you know. Okay. Um, and and you, you, you mentioning uh, mental health uh, problems. I yeah. particularly admired the way you dealt with it and um, in, in both the house of the rising sun where somebody is a parent is looking after a child with with mental health and and how society deals with that you know and and the difficulties you know of perhaps being a single parent single mother looking after or a widowed uh in in, in this case as well as in is in, in in Aznin where there's yeah. loss where a mm -hmm. mother has wanted to have a child so i want i, I want you to walk us through that particular bit were you were you a bit nervous about dealing with that with those issues in those two particular stories um no not so much with Nazneen, maybe with house of the rising sun because it's uh you know um it's it's a it's a heavy story if I put it that. i mean both of them are heavy uh mm. but i think probably Nazneen is maybe a lot easier for people to relate to it in, in the sense that you can see the process right that led her to where she got to in the end but uh with with uh, house of the rising sun you just find them in that situation and uh, you know how how the story goes is not particularly very bright i think and uh, but but for me the important thing is capturing this reality that's that exists for a lot of people that you know have to do with uh, uh, people who are suffering from mental health issues. Um, mm -hmm. A few a few months ago, there was this I'll call it an outbreak of news stories coming from Kano State, for instance, Kano in the north of Nigeria, uh, where you have people, uh, the authorities going to people's houses and discovering that they have mentally challenged people locked up in their rooms right some for there was there was one guy who had been locked up for nearly 30 years by his parents and there's uh there's a woman who was locked up for like six years by her family you know i mean these people are chained locked up in a room where they defecate they eat there they don't go anywhere they look like i don't know they look like monsters right because there's no there's no system to cater for this mentally challenged people, right? Mm. Um, so if you take them to a psychiatry hospital or any of these places that should cater for them, they are not properly cared for. And then you have to continue spending money. And then you go there, you see them in that condition and it breaks your heart. Uh, so some people feel like, okay, you know, let's just bring them home, keep them at home. Uh, some, some people, some of them, right, have this attitude about mental illness, thinking that, well, you know, this is because of substance abuse, this is because of uh, something this person did to himself. That's why he's the way he is. Uh, the failure to understand that, yes, uh, you know, some of the things are, are beyond the control of the patients, right? So there's, there's a need to care for them in a different way. Um, but the main issue is this, right? This lack of support. Mm for the families dealing with these issues um and that's that was the essence of that story the fact that this woman had to cater for this child and she's practically alone and this mm -hmm. child has very very special needs and uh, it affects her family life it affects her relationship with other people it affects her career you know and it's it affects her qualities and confidence as a mother as well you know so that focus, I wanted the focus to be on the woman who is catering for this child who has mental uh, health issues. Mm -hmm. Right, um, maybe less heavy. Mm. Yes. One of my other favorite mm. characters, 
is about Morara. <laughs> Morara. Uh, now here's a question. <laughs> that rascal. The father of Zango. The now, father of Zango, here's a yes. question for you. Yes. Um, as an artist, is there some work that you have been hesitant to, to, to part with? In the same way that like Abba Morora was like, you know, do, do, is there some piece of writing you've done and you're just like, somebody says, okay, we'd like you to write this. And you're like, nah, this is, this is too good. I can't, you know, I can't do this. Um, no, not really. I mean, there's stuff I've written I've never showed anyone. Uh, I probably would never show anyone, probably. Um, not for sentimental reasons like Abbo Mororo, I think, but mm. uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think every creative has that phase you go through where you feel like, you know, maybe this is the epitome of what you're going to produce as a creative, right? And uh, mm. you can't top that, so maybe better not to put it out there because if you put it out there, that essentially means the end of your career as a creative. Mm. Uh, because from there you can't go anywhere but down. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. And and Abba Mororo realized that that you know he can't do anything better than what he did that last time. So that was us it for you know. Somebody wants to know Ndegwa again, uh, mm -hmm. and he's taking us to season of crimson blossoms. Hey hey. That was like so Friends of six, seven years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And this question is, when yeah. I read it, unless I'm mistaken, I felt like there was no expounding of some rituals of the house of culture that were brought forth in the novel. For example, mm -hmm. Binta and all the women in her age group are not, uh, don't want to acknowledge their firstborn. There is little to no information on such practices out there. And I was wondering why you included it without further unpacking. Um, hmm. Wasn't that unpacked enough? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think um, the fact that I, I I stand to be corrected. I don't think anyone has written about that issue before. Um, and the fact that I wrote about it kind of uh, made a lot of people think about this culture and this practice. And what I can tell you is what I wrote there is as much as I know as anyone else. Um, since I've written this book, you know, I've tried to get more information about how this practice came into being specifically, and there's no definitive answer, right, of how it came into being, what is the exact objective of it. So we've been left with uh, conjectures and all of that. But I'm happy I wrote about it because it started a conversation about it. And nice. uh, hopefully we'll get uh, some research, do proper research on this issue and find out how it came about. But I've asked a lot of uh, professors and uh, intellectuals who study in the area of house culture. And to be honest, none of them has a definitive answer about it. So that much you have is the much there is actually in the book. Oh, okay. Um, right. The other thing, we let me come back to Dreams and Assorted Nightmares, and I'm going to talk about melancholy. Melancholy <laughs> is, <laughs> it's that other story where I was just like, it was that other story. The wild and crazy. What was going through your head when you came up with that monstrous character? I was in a crazy place. I, I just, I just felt like going all out. I just felt like being wild. Right? I, I, I removed whatever inhibitions I have on myself as a person, as a creative, and just put it aside. And I say, you know what? Just go all the way with this. Whatever it is, that's what it is. You know, and um, I hope it works. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. You know, I have a friend who, who is like properly creeped out by that creature. Like properly, properly creeped out. And... <laughs> <laughs> I, I sometimes I, when, when I was writing it and reading it I'm like god damn what the hell is this thing <laughs> <laughs> I loved it hey? <laughs> yeah but but you know I, I wanted to create um it's sort of like an alternative to a ghost story right where this is not a ghost that has 
like hair down her face and all of that and doing weird mm. shit. But just this presence that that yeah. affects your emotions, your mood, your all of that. And it's something you can't get rid of. It's something that you're stuck with. You have to do it. Uh, and then there's I very think special circumstances. Even more mm-hmm. is Victorian coming back, you know? Because she's yeah. like, oh, I was sadder outside. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was crazy. <laughs> it's it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Really. Um, yeah, that was that was fun to write. Really, that was fun to write. And uh, you know, I think with the whole collection, I just um put aside my inhibitions and just let the stories flow. So I think that's all, you know, I, I was as crazy as I wanted to be. So it was great for writing this series. It really was. Yeah. Which Anna wants to know, when you wrote the title story, Dreams and Assorted Nightmares, did you not write there and then that you were going to expand it to a collection? Um, no, actually that title story wasn't the first story I wrote, right? Um, hmm. I'd written some of the stories before, yeah. And then I felt like Zango needed a proper introduction. All right. So that was how that first story came out to be. Yeah. All right. Um, are there any other questions? Anybody wants to ask Abu Bakr anything else? Um, before I'm, I'm gonna just make a revelation. Mm-hmm. Um, I have I have made this announcement before on social media, but for those of you who missed it or are not on social media, we are doing Abu Bakr was part of Afrolits. Sans Frontiers last year, which was like our little fun thing to do during the yeah, yeah. during 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 the lockdown. Yeah. And um, you know, from that, our fantastic agent who seems to be in the house um sorted out a deal for us with Audible, and uh we're going to do something called Afrolit Shorts. And you are sub your story is going to be the first in the series. In fact, it's about to go to be recorded. Yay. Um, yeah, I love like this. I love that story, man. Um, Thank I you. Want, Thank and, and so, of course, guys, those of you on Audible, you'll be able to get that. That will be the first story in the Afro Lit Short. Uh, mm. Tell us about the process of writing that. And it's something from a longer work that's whatever. But yeah. that particular piece, man, that was beautiful. Yeah, that particular piece. Um, so this this was a novel I kind of uh, struggled with a bit, right? Writing it and all of that. I mean, I was clear about the idea of the story and all of that. I just thought maybe there was something that wasn't quite right. But the moment I got to that part, right, the character of Indu just comes alive and she sizzles and she dazzles and she talks and I'm like, God damn, this woman is sweet. Yeah. <laughs> Sassy, I love her. <laughs> she, she is. She's like one of my most favorite characters. Right? Hey, she's she doesn't give a damn about anything. She swears. She uses curse word. And this is a woman who's like uh, eighty something years old. Right? I mean, she she rocked it well, when I she was a young I, I think, woman. I think at you that know, age she, you have a right not to have any inhibitions. Uh, Uchenna, well, I mean, not not in this culture, talking, right? Yeah. Yeah. We're talking about a story that's coming in, on Audible. That will be the first that Abu Bakr will, Abu Bakr's story will be the first one. It's called A Love mm-hmm. Like This, you know, mm-hmm. for the uh, Audible shots. So, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Download so Audible and that, you'll be able to mm-hmm. get it there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go you on. Know, in, in, in this culture, uh, you know, we all have our parents who were like really funky guys when we were young, right? And then we happened to them and they became this uh, <laughs> dreary looking people who just like pretend to be like all piles all through their lives until you find their old photographs, right? <laughs> <laughs> with those outfits. Yeah, with those outfits and those funky hairstyles and all of that. Uh, but they never talk about these issues. They never, and somehow you kind of feel like, well, maybe they pretend that, you know, it's a part of their life they don't want to acknowledge at all. But uh, Indo was not like that. She lived, she had fun, and she was very proud of, of what she did when she did it, you know. And she had no apologies about it. So all of that comes true. And that, for me, also a very fascinating experience, writing, writing her character. Mm. 
Right. Any mm -hmm. any other question here? Uh, no other question. Mm -hmm. Who shall we talk about now? What shall we talk about? Okay, not who, because mm -hmm. we can't talk about people. <laughs> but anyway, all right, all right. I want to go back to the father of Zango. I want to go back to, to Abba Mororo. Actually, somebody wanted to know. Abba Mororo. Why, yeah. Yes. Somebody wanted to know before I go, before I ask, I ask more about him, that your characters, uh -huh. you have all these characters called Abba, uh -huh. and she's curious about that. What's with this name? Abba is father, right? Abba oh. is father, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Abba is like dad. Uh, and there's some mm. people are just called Abba for father. Okay. Yeah, Mirella, that's the answer. Abba. Okay, fantastic. Uh, any other questions from anybody? Um, as we go on, and uh, we are actually in our last nine minutes. This happens all the time when you and I talk. Uchena would like to hear your thoughts about Zaki. He says personally he saw him as the new Reza. Is this the same for you? I think after Zaki cut down that tree, there's no Reza there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Zaki is just that curious person, right? I mean. Uh, whereas Reza would mind his business and uh, if trouble doesn't come to him, he doesn't go to it. Or maybe he goes to it when he wants to go to it, right? Zaki is curious about mm -hmm. everything and anything. I mean, everyone too, you know. All the weird things that happen in Zongo, Zaki is curious about them. He was the one who wanted to go and uh, find the transparent girl. Um, and he was the one who measured the hair that came out of Vera in the first story. You know, I mean, he's, he's obsessed with the weird and the bizarre. So I don't see him more like um, more like Reza in that sense. I, I see him as a different person, actually. Um, and in the end, we see him taking agency, you know, and uh, doing crazy stuff, right? Uh, but we've seen the trajectory from where he has come and, and where he got to. So um, Zaiki is Zaiki, <laughs> you know, he's not Reza at all. And uh, Reza is, is who he is. Now, I have to tell you about the name Vera because of that mm. hair strand thing. <laughs> <laughs> now, you yeah. know, you know, in, in, in South Africa, there's a, in Joburg in particular, there's a story about Vera the ghost. And uh -huh. Vera is um, supposedly this ghost that, that wears white and then uh, will pick up uh, men on the freeway or men will wait for, or will give her a lift. And then they mm -hmm. wake up the next morning and they find themselves like in a graveyard naked. Oh. You know? Okay. Yeah. So, and then now you have this Vera with the strand of hair that's like going on and on and on and on. Or mm -hmm. as Zaki tells us, it's like one kilometer times whatever. <laughs> uh, I just want to say that you, mm -hmm. you put me in a space where I thought to myself, I should totally warn all my friends who want to name their child Vera, that perhaps it's it's not a good idea because South Africa and Nigeria clearly have a you know a story with this Vera thing. Um, um, so <laughs> the strand of no, hair, you, you know, actually, I think I think you know all those Veras you're talking about, right? They sound like totally fascinating people. Hmm. Right. Uh, I'm sure Zaki, Zaki Kori would absolutely love to meet the South African Veras. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely right. I, I, and, can uh, see Zaki, I can see Zaki I mean, I'll, I'll, in I'll, that I'll, graveyard, you know? <laughs> yeah, I'd like to meet them if only they're just going to talk to me and not do weird things with me. Yeah, I'll be fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So um, if you can arrange a are... meeting, right? Negotiate a meeting and and uh, with clear terms that I'm not to be hot, I'm not to be stripped naked or put in a graveyard or anything. We're just going to have I'll, a conversation. Four one nine. I always make a plan for you, so I'll I'll, I'll make it happen. <laughs> yeah. Great, great. <laughs> right, and we've come to the exciting part of this show, where we are selecting the winners, mm -hmm. the five winners of this fantastic book, Dreams. Yeah and assorted nightmares 
And uh, Ndegwa, I think there's already been, that has already been done, uh, the Vera story from a Kenyan perspective. Okay, mm -hmm. our first winner, patient, is patient Iribagiza here? Patient, going once. Patient, going twice. All right, I guess patient is not here. Still the first win. Mm. Barbara, you're a winner. Barbara Soma. Oh, again. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Please, I will I'll send you an email again. Um, oh, actually, I have your email address. So I'll send both books to you now because now I have the book from the last one. Lucky oh, you. Okay, thank you. So happy. Fantastic. Second winner. Mm. Rolin is Rolin here Rolin from Namibia okay Rolin is not here um, Muonga Kaunda from Zambia Muonga okay Muonga is not there let me try again Rujeko, you're a winner. Rujeko, are you in the house? Yes, I Ooh, see you. Yes, I am. <laughs> All right, you're our second winner. Oh, for so doing nice. The nightmares. Thank you. I will send the books to you, the book to you, as I already got them from, uh, from Masobe. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Is Hilda here? Hilda from Femright. Hilda is not here. So, okay, we're going to have two Ugandan winners, but that has been lost. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, the, I've, I've picked a person, but I can't give them because it's our agent, it's Sharon. <laughs> I, will, I will happily donate mine. Thank you. All right, let me find somebody else. Yahaya Abubakar Dabo, it does not seem to be here. All right. Ah, Helen, maybe you'll be lucky. Hey, I'm here. What do you mean? <laughs> <That's>... Nah. <laughs> David Juniors, David Juniors from Namibia, not here. Mm, all right. Uchena, you're a winner. Uchena, are you still here? I saw you earlier. Yes, you are. Uchena, there you are. Well done. You are third winner. Two more people to go. Maureen Cassidy. Maureen is not here. Truth or Smith, I don't know why I almost said Truth or Dare, but mm -hmm. it's Truth and then or oh, Smith, but they're not here, they don't seem to be here. So I suppose I could make that joke because they're not here. <laughs> Belinda Chomiendo, Belinda, Belinda not here. Mm. Harriet Maona, not here. This is fun, and I still haven't picked Ndegwa. <laughs> <laughs> Sophie. Sophie Shidaro Kirin, not here. Sorry. I think you would have enjoyed that one, Sophie. Mm. Tando Kazi Masetti. Tando Masetti. 
Tando Massetti. Nope, not here. Mm, right. Um, well, Leia is not here, and you was the other winner. Ah. Kenna is not here, and she had one. Uh, Sif. Ah, Yahaya, I see you. You're connecting. Yahaya is here, so since you are here, you get to win your book. Let me look, let me look, let me look, let me look, let me look. Mm. Mm. Ah, there you are. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations, you're one of our winners for Dreams and Assorted Nightmares. Can you hear me? Your fourth winner. One more person to go. A.M. Smith. Yes, thank you. Oh, fantastic. Wonderful. Your fifth winner. That's I will send you an email and you can get your book. Congratulations to everyone who has won. And everybody else, sorry, sorry, sorry. Better luck next time. Um, Helen, I will send you my personal copy. Or you can just wait. It's not oh, a Oh, thanks. <laughs> that would be great. That would be great. Well, alternatively, you can just wait because Prestige will have the books. Um, Uchena, I've been waiting since email... last year. <laughs> Uchena, I will email you personally and I will get your, your address because I've got your email address here. So everybody else, I will send you. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> any last words from the Guta Institute, Joburg, who so wonderfully decided that they were going to host Abu Bakr. Hi everyone. Oh, it was so it was amazing. Thank you so much. It was so <laughs> enchanting. I it, it was beautiful. Um, so thank you so much everyone for joining us. As well. We really had a lot of fun and it was uh it was good. It was amazing. I'm looking forward to the next one. <laughs> Definitely. So what I, mm -hmm. so what we will do is from my side I will just play some music after everyone has said their byes just to chilled vibe again just for Abu Bakr any any yaya yeah, yeah. Abu Bakr any last words um it's always a pleasure talking to you folks um, really really a pleasure and thank you both for hosting um, and everyone for coming um sorry to those who didn't win